It's episode 31 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show, and I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. This show is designed to empower women to find their own expression of the keto diet to maximize their health and happiness. Now let's get started with today's episode. Hey there, friends. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me as always. You might be able to hear that I am slightly under the weather, although my voice has gotten a lot better as the day has progressed. I had a really fun weekend and it landed me with almost no voice for a while and a little bit of a sore throat, but I am feeling fine. I'm much better, but you might notice a little bit of scratchiness. I might not sound exactly like myself and that would be why. That's okay. It's not going to last the whole episode because we have an interview today with one of my friends, Karen Martell. And so when we recorded that interview, I was fully well. So you will not hear this throughout the whole conversation. Don't worry. Before we get going with the show, let's chat about the sponsor of this episode of the Keto for Women show, Health IQ. Health IQ is an insurance company that helps health conscious people like runners, cyclists, weightlifters, and healthy eaters get lower rates on their life insurance. Health IQ can save their customers up to 33% because they have found scientific proof showing physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive. Like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. I've partnered with Health IQ because I'm a huge fan of their philosophy on recognizing those that take their health seriously, like us Keto for Womeners, and rewarding us for doing so by saving us money on our life insurance rates. Head to healthiq.com slash keto to see if you qualify and to support the show. There, you will take a quick lifestyle quiz, which will determine your potential savings. That's health iq.com slash keto to learn more. Doing this intro, I did just want to bring up a few quick things before we get into our talk with Karen today. Really, the only thing I want to make sure to mention right now is there's been some changes to my business structure and what I offer clients and how I work with people. And the biggest thing, we'll talk more about this in upcoming episodes, but the biggest thing I want you to know right now is one of those changes includes a new course. And this new course is open to anyone and everyone, and it is all about your gut health, specifically being able to test your gut health and what's actually going on in your gut through the use of functional lab testing, which in this case is a stool test, and then also optional food sensitivity testing. So if you're one of the people, there's so many out there, and it's even something that we talk about in this conversation that I have with Karen today, that have issues with their gut health, their digestion's off, you're not feeling good after you're eating, things like that can make take a major toll on your health. And I love working with people that have gut issues because it really is something that can turn around and reverse quickly. And when that happens, you feel so much better and you start seeing some really good improvements in your health and your weight, if that's something that's staying on without a reason. Things like that can really turn around when you just look at your gut health. So Because I have such a passion for it, it's kind of the thing that I love to talk about beyond keto and hormones and that kind of stuff, I created a course for that. Now, this current class, which I am accepting enrollment for right now, is a beta group. And what that means is that it's smaller, it's the first group, so it's kind of one of those situations where some things may not be 100% perfect and streamlined, and that's kind of one of the perks that you get, you get a discounted rate to belong to the beta group with the knowledge that you may have a few hiccups to go through here and there along with me as I'm trying to make the course the best that it is. And I also ask all of my beta group testers to provide me with honest feedback about the class and what could be improved 
or what you loved, that kind of thing to just help it become better and better. So that is what's going on right now. Enrollment is currently open and will be for the next few days. You can find out all this information over on my website, seanminer.com. Go under nutrition and health services and you'll see work with Sean as an option. And you can learn more about all of the courses I now offer and specifically this gut course, which beta testing stage only, but it is called the Good Gut Project and is going to be awesome. You'll finally get the answers you've been searching for. I promise. I see it all the time, searching and searching for answers and they don't come about until you actually test the health of your gut. So you can go ahead and look for that if that's something you're interested in. I will talk more about that when we have more time next week, but just wanted to get that word out there for this initial beta group. And just keep in mind, all of these groups are going to be small group classes. There's not a whole lot of opportunity when you're doing something so specific to have large groups because it is a lot of obviously work on my part for the testing and protocol collecting and being able to interact with you all on such an important topic. I have to keep those groups small. So it's a very limited number of people and always will be as these classes progress. But just go ahead and check it out and then see if you want to join in on this beta group. If not, we're going to try again and it'll be available later on this year as well. Not in the beta category because hopefully I will have gotten the kinks out and it will be perfected after this first round. That's all we'll chat about for now because I really want to get into this interview with Karen. You guys are going to love this. She is an expert on weight loss resistance, which I know is a ginormous topic in the keto community, in the keto for women community. I get these questions a lot. I talk about it a lot. I talk about it so much here. I talk about it so much in the Fat Burning Female Project, but we need to keep hearing this and I think it helps to hear it from different people. So I'm going to keep talking about it and I'm going to keep inviting people on to talk about it. So that's what we're doing today with Karen. Let me introduce you to her. Karen Martell is a certified transformational nutrition coach and weight loss expert. After a lifetime of struggling with her own health issues, Karen is determined to bring her knowledge to other women. She has a bold new approach to women's health and weight management. Karen's passion lies in helping women find their weight loss code through body positive nutrition, correcting digestive issues, optimizing hormones, and managing chronic stress. She is the founder of the On Track Meal Planning and Group Coaching Program and host of the On Track Videocast on YouTube. She is a health leader and researcher determined to revolutionize nutrition for modern women. All right, let's get into our talk with Karen. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women today. Yay. I'm so happy to be here, Sean. Thanks for having me. I know this is going to be great. And we've already spoken before. I spoke in your group and we'll probably talk about what you do and all that stuff coming up here. So we already know that we have a lot in common, you and I, specifically about how we feel about women's health and weight loss and all of these things that we talk about here on Keto for Women. And so for me, it is like my ultimate goal and mission to get women to understand this. And it seems like I need more than just me saying it yeah. <laughs> to potentially get the point across, which is why I'm very happy that you're here. <laughs> yes. where well, there's very few of us that speak about this kind of stuff because honestly, it doesn't sell. No, it doesn't. <laughs> People and I, want quick I, fix. <laughs> I talked about that in past episodes. It's like, I'm not in the diet industry. The diet industry is what sells. I'm in the health yeah. industry. It's a little less flashy, <laughs> but it's yeah. what works. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever read Rob Wolf's book, um, The Wired to Eat. Yes, I have. And he he says the same thing where he was like, people think I'm crazy for writing this book because books like this don't sell. People right. want to hear that there's some, you know, one size fits all diet. And I'm here to tell you there isn't. Yeah, there's not. Good <laughs> luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and you came about into this field because of your own personal health story. And so I always think that starting with that really gets our listeners to know you and know that you probably have a similar story to people out there. So why don't you go ahead with that first? Yeah, you bet. Well, first off, if anyone would have told me that I was going to be in the business of weight loss, I would never have believed them. Yeah. <laughs> because like you just said, hate 
the diet industry. And that's because I swear I was on a diet since I was 13 years old until I figured my own shit out, basically. So (laughs) when I was really young, like I said, since I was 13, I was being put on a diet. My mother was putting me on diet since I was that age. And not even that I was really heavy, Sean. I was you know, never in my life was I more than like 15, 20 pounds overweight. But for a young girl, I suddenly started to hit puberty. My mom put me on birth control and I suddenly just packed it on overnight. And then that was the start of it. I became super obsessed with my body, went through high school, going through the whole bulimia phase of, I had really wished actually that I could be anorexic in high school. I remember thinking, God, if I could just starve myself, that would be the answer. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I liked food so much that I resorted to, you know, stuffing my face and then making myself vomit. So that went on for years. And as I went into my 20s, I rode this roller coaster of this up and down weight. And finally, when I had my daughter, when I was in my early 30s, there was no more down. It was just a steady climb up. And I started to gain more and more weight. And I was doing everything that I was supposed to be doing. I was working out harder than I had ever worked out in my life, like doing the boot camp five days a week, started running. I was watching every single thing that went through my mouth. This just went on and on for years and my weight just kept going up. And I finally actually went in to see my naturopath about it. And this was seven, eight years ago. And in my city, nobody had ever heard of paleo or ketogenic. It's only just come around like within the last year. Mm -hmm. We're a little bit far behind here in Canada. (laughs) So when I went to him, he said, you know, and he knew nothing about it either, but he said, I just went to this, you know, anti-aging seminar and he said, apparently the best diet that's coming out right now is ketogenic diet. And I was like, oh, so I left his office. I went and bought some keto sticks, went home, started researching it. And actually through my research found Mark Staley Apple. And I went out, bought his 21 day primal blueprint and started the paleo diet that day. And everything changed for me as far as the bloated in my stomach got better. My blood sugar was more stable than it had ever been. I loved the food. I felt like, oh my God, I found my perfect diet. And I went hardcore for months and months and I never lost a pound. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Right. And I know that you hear this with keto, I'm sure quite a bit where people are like, yes, right. They think they found this perfect diet because Joe Blow over here. And that was the thing is Mark's Daily Apple had all those success stories. And you see these people that, you know, lost 100, 200 pounds on the paleo diet. And I'm like, but why am I not? Because I knew I was doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And other things kept going wrong. Like, that stuff got better, but I was still having food sensitivities to everything. And I was still having like really bad hormonal problems and with the PMS and I had insomnia and I was like, what the heck is going on? So I dug in and to make a long story short, it was years of trying to figure out what else was at play when it came to my weight loss resistance. And it ended up being a whole mixture and I had to kind of address everything, which was my hormonal state. I found out that my adrenal system was totally shot, which I had never thought that I was a so-called stressed out person. I had a ton of emotional issues that I had to deal with that were, you know, about hating my body, disrespecting my body over the years. I had to face all of that, which wasn't fun. And over basically a two-year period, I came kind of full circle and healed my system, both emotionally and physically. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't quick. Mm -hmm. It took time. And from there, I then, you know, spent the next couple of years researching nutrition and diet more and more and more. And then I went back to school and I decided, you know what, I actually do have to deal with weight loss. I have to help women with weight loss, which was just like, I fought even that. Even in school, they were like, you got to pick a niche and it's got to be something that you yourself have struggled with. And I was like, nope not doing it, not doing it. I am not going into the world of weight loss. It's too hard. It's too frustrating. 
And of course, this is where I end up. How can I not share the share the word with other women that are having the same struggles? Yeah, I mean, it is literally every single day of my business life (laughs) that I hear that same thing. I'm doing everything right. I've done keto this way. I've done paleo this way. I've done this. I've done that. And I am not losing any weight. What is wrong with me? Yeah, I I honestly feel like we're in this crazy epidemic with women right now with weight loss resistance. Like these women, like you said, they're doing it all right. They're eating right. And this is the women that I deal with is that is the weight loss resistance that, you know, big. And I know you're going to agree with this, too, is the number one cause right now is usually stress. Oh, a thousand percent. And it's such a cycle, too, because we do this diet, we're doing it hardcore. So we think we're doing it extra right. Yeah. (laughs) And it causes more stress on our body. And then we get stressed out because we're not losing weight. And then we try to see what else we should be doing. And it's like we're piling on the stress even more. Yeah. Yeah. So backing out of that gets even harder to where you could lose weight. You're just digging the hole deeper. Yeah. And people just want to hear like, okay, we'll change this, what you're eating. And I still have women contact me. Well, a good example. I just had a woman, she did awesome. You know, when she first started out on the paleo diet and she was losing some weight and then she suddenly contacts me, Karen, I've gained some weight and I'm just been really stressed out lately in my life and I've been sick. But do you think that I need to be cutting back? Do you think it's the paleo? Do you think Mm -hmm. it's my diet? Mm -hmm. Uh, No, I don't. And I think it's obviously coming from this diet industry and what we have been taught to expect is that all you have to do is change your food, you know, so we have this tunnel vision on our food and, you know, maybe work out a little bit more. Some people do, some people don't, you know, but do that and you will see your body change. There is no other interest in anything else around. So that's all we're focused on. We don't even look at how stressed our lives are or how our gut's doing or how we're sleeping, what our relationship status is. One big thing that you brought up that I definitely want to get into is the emotional state you're in. Yes. Which is huge, those mental blocks that we have. And so yeah, yeah, let's just get into all of it. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. So let's start. I know that for you, you're, again, very similar in that you have to look at the state of your hormones and adrenals and you have to look at your gut health. Yeah. Those are two things that we're currently not remotely looking deep enough into when we're figuring out why someone's not losing weight. No, because doctors are telling women when they come in and they say, I'm depressed, I have anxiety, I can't sleep. And he goes, well, you're only 35 years old, 38 years old. You don't have hormone dysfunction. Right. You can't. Right. This is what they're told all the time. Here's your antidepressant. You need to work out more and you need to eat less. Mm Mm-hmm. And take and these this, pills. And take these pills. Yeah, that are probably going to cause weight gain as a side effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. So let's talk about this. So what do you see in your practice that are common as far as the adrenals and hormones go, keeping women from losing weight? Cortisol either being, so cortisol is your stress hormone for those that don't know. So every time you're stressed out, even if it's low grade stress, and I always tell women, don't even look at it as when I say you're stressed out, this isn't why you're not losing weight. When you think about stress, think about what in your life isn't making you happy. What are you worrying about on a constant day-to-day basis? Are you in a bad relationship? Do you hate your job? You know, are you just, do you never have time for yourself? This is stress. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think some people, and I know because this is what I did, is people associate stress being that person that is acting stressed out. Right. (laughs) was it been around? <laughs> I'm so stressed, that kind of thing. And it doesn't have to, it can be really low grade, but constant stress. So my number one thing that I see in here is definitely cortisol either being too high or it's gotten to the point that it's too low, which means that they've been highly stressed for a long period of time and now it's too low. And so they're not producing enough cortisol. And that's when you hit like the fatigue stage, you're kind of wired but tired and the weight around the middle. So that's probably number one. Second to that is estrogen dominance, Mm -hmm. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
estrogen dominance weight around the middle again, you know, you lose your sex drive. It usually overtakes progesterone, which is a really common thing. The ratio between the estrogen and progesterone is really off. So your estrogen levels may look totally normal on a blood test, but in relation to the progesterone, it's off, which causes PMS, like I said, low sex drive, weight gain. And the heavier you are, the more estrogen you're producing because fat cells produce estrogen. So a lot of women don't know that. So if you're heavy, you can kind of guarantee you that you're going to have estrogen dominance. And if you have any sort of stress in your life, then that progesterone level usually takes a hit when you yeah, are yes. stressed out. Yes. Yeah. I always say like consider cortisol like the big steroid guy that's in your body blocking the door yes. <laughs> to all the other hormones like your thyroid, your progesterone. And we know that thyroid is an indicator of your metabolism, like how high is your metabolism running? And if your cortisol is high all the time, guess what? It's going to block that thyroid from being used in your body. Mm-hmm. Yes, Not exactly. Good. And so I think I've talked about that quite a bit on this podcast and just how much stress can play a role. And I think it just also starting to get people to understand that. And I think now we really need to kind of get maybe some ideas of, okay, I know I'm stressed. Fine. That's why I'm not losing weight. Geez. Okay. So what do you suggest people do? What are some tips you have to kind of reduce that? Well, like I said, first, take a look at your life and decide what areas are not making you happy. And then I always tell people, what if you don't change that? So let's say it's your relationship. Go down the road a year, two years. What does it look like if you don't fix that problem soon? Well, you'll probably continue to gain weight. You know, you're going to get more and more miserable. Your children will start to be affected by it. It just, in general, you're just not going to be a very happy person. Life's going to suck. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us, we can't look forward. We have a hard time going down the line basically and saying, what's going to happen if I don't change this? You know, your hormones are going to get more messed up. And like I said, you're going to continue to gain weight. So first of all, determine that because I think that that's a really good motivation basically to change things that need to be changed in your life. And it's a lot easier to look at it like that than it is to on a day-to-day basis where you're like, oh, I guess because Karen told me I better meditate to relax. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than saying to yourself, I have to do this because if I don't, my quality of life is going to continue to go down. And so I always encourage women to look at it in the big picture and then decide what it is they can do to change that right now. So not only change your circumstances, if that needs to be changed, right? So do you need to start looking for another job? Do you need to start looking for another husband? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Right? Like those are the big questions. Right. It's not on a big scale like that if it's just a day-to-day thing. One of my favorite tools that I've been using myself and I I love it for my clients is change your perception. Mm. So, you know, we're often told, well, we need to start meditating. And I always suggest that too, like the common, okay, you should probably meditate, maybe do some yoga, go for a walk in nature, be more mindful. All those, those are great tools to lower stress. Another thing though, is there's a lot of stuff that we can't change in our life. So we change our perception. So let's say you don't like your job, but you can't change that. Find the things that are great about it. There's always going to be something. So do you like the people you work with? Concentrate on that. If you hate driving your kids around all day, you know, because you're going to soccer practice and you're going to their school and you get frustrated every time you're driving and your stress goes up because you feel like you're just this taxi driver, well, somehow make driving fun. You know, put on your favorite music while you're driving. Don't quit associating these things with something negative and start associating it with something positive. And it's an instant like mood booster when you do that. (laughs) It's the whole like, you know, when the whole grateful thing, Mm -hmm. you know, be grateful for three things every day. That's another really good one. So in these situations where you usually start to stress out about whatever's happening, instead change that thought and be grateful for something in that moment instead. And it'll instantly change your stress levels. I think that's such a great tip and not enough people are doing it because again, we are 
kind of always in this space of like, okay, at first it's this and it's this, this and this. We never think about how am I actually feeling about this? And yeah. can I turn that from, because most of the time it's negative because we just yep. live in a negative society, unfortunately. And yes. you, if you can change that to a more positive aspect, like I tell clients that complain about having to meal prep, <laughs> that <laughs> like I actually love cooking. It's one of my self-care kind of like almost meditative times of my day. Yeah. Like turn on some really good music, dance a little yeah. bit, chop up some veggies. It could actually be pretty fun. You just yeah. have to change your perception of it. So I think that's, yeah, such a good point to make. Okay. So yeah. So we all know hormones, big deal. Yeah. Also less known, but very important, the gut. Oh, yes. Big deal. And you know what's funny is I just did this big survey with all of my subscribers and I asked them a few questions about what they would like to know more about. And one of them was digestion. And then, of course, I had weight loss in there. I had hormones. The top two were weight loss. The first one was weight loss. Of course. Everybody. <laughs> Second was hormones. and the, But the very last, which was this, this little tiny dent, was digestion. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Because yeah. it's a huge piece to a puzzle that most yes. of us are missing. Everybody has digestive problems. Yeah. <laughs> huge. Well, let me just tell you, if you have stress in your life, probably also you have digest. digestive <laughs> issues. Yeah. <laughs> They're very connected. But yeah, so is that what you're seeing in your practice then is people are kind of overlooking that as something that could be contributing? Yes. I think it's become very normal. Like, well, yeah, I get bloated. Well, I have heartburn. I get diarrhea. And they just say it to me like, well, don't you have all this? <laughs> right. Like, isn't this normal? <laughs> because even like the acid blockers, I think they were one of the highest. And it's not that the highest, but it's one of the highest prescribed drugs is acid blockers for indigestion. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like that's. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I know. So yeah, I always tell people everybody in North America has some degree of leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And you can tell kind of to what degree as to what your symptoms are. So if you're going to the bathroom 10 times a day, you know that your leaky gut's really bad, right? Same with if you're only pooping once a week. We got a problem on our hands. This is not normal. To grow two pant sizes by the end of the day because you're so bloated, not normal. Heartburn, not normal. And people think heartburn is so normal. I know. Yeah. It's like, well, I just popped some Tums, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not how life is supposed to work. <laughs> no. And clearly then they're eating something they shouldn't be. And like you said, these things are all connected, right? you got hormone problems, you're going to have a digestive problem. Your stress is high. It's going to affect your blood sugar. It's going to affect your digestion. It's going to make your body inflamed, which then inflames the gut, which then means you're not absorbing the nutrients out of your food, which then means your metabolism goes down, which means you're tired because you're not getting those nutrients. It's this like horrible circle that, mm -hmm. that goes round and round. So I think it's so important to address the gut. For myself, I switched to paleo. Like I said, a lot of my like bloating and, and things got so much better. But over the years, I kept getting food sensitivities. And I was like, hey, what's the matter? And I finally was listening to some podcast and this man was like, if you've, you know, you're following the paleo diet or the ketogenic diet and you're doing everything right, but you're still continuing to have leaky gut symptoms or hormonal dysfunction, look for an underlying infection. So I marched into my naturopath's office and I said, that's it. Like, give me the best stool test you got. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> and sure enough, it comes back that I riddled with blastocystis hominis, which mm -hmm. is a horrible parasite that I had picked up in my international travels when I was young. So I probably had had it for 10 years. Terrible infection of the gut. And that's something I definitely see in my office. So if somebody, in, for your listeners too, if you've been following the keto or the paleo diet, I'm going to give you the same advice. If you're still having leaky gut symptoms or you're still having these skin rashes or head fog or anxiety even can be a side effect, then go and find out because parasites are far more <laughs> prevalent than people think they are. There's also candida, H. pylori, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. These are all really common infections of the gut that I'm seeing more and more in my practice. Yeah. And I think it's pretty logical to understand that just 
the stress of that, let alone anything else, let alone the yes. inflammation and the leaky gut that it's causing, but the stress of your body trying to fight this thing that's not supposed yeah. to be there for however many years is enough to throw things out of the loop. Yes. So there's not just mental stress, there's physical stress that's mm-hmm. happening too, right? Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And a big one, you know, I think it's very common for women to completely overlook, like we've talked about, the fact that they're not having a normal bowel movement, but yet they're super frustrated with not losing weight and they're extremely connected. So if you are someone that deals with constipation, you really do need to get something figured out. Get that gut tested. Okay. So then let's move on because of course, diet does come up. In your practice, I'm assuming, yes, yes. Yeah. like we do have to talk about food a little bit as nutritionists. <laughs> so tell me kind of what you see in your practice, what you recommend, how it works best for your clients. So in my practice, I always start with the food, actually. Like I take a full intake. And of course, if I see that there's you know lots of digestive problems and there's hormonal issues, I still start with the gut because sometimes it is just food related and it's because of what they're eating. So I take out all the trigger foods. It's paleo or ketogenic, depending on exactly what I'm working with, with the person or paleo ketogenic or autoimmune paleo. Mm-hmm are the three that I start with, depending on the person. And we do that for 30 days. And then we see what's happened. So many people, like 80% of the people will come back saying that it worked great. Their digestive problems have cleared up. They have their energy back. It's pretty miraculous. And I know that you know that too with the keto. But if they haven't lost weight, then yes, we start to dig deeper. And then we look at the hormonal state and get the hormones tested. If we're still dealing with digestive problems after 30 days, even following one of those programs, then I usually suggest getting tested for one of the underlying infections, depending on what their symptoms are, whether that be candida or parasites, H. pylori, one of those, right, are usually the most common. Mm -hmm. And then we go from there and and start to just, it's like the onion, we just started peeling back the layers. But usually for most people, it's not years like I had to do because I know now what I'm looking for. And besides that, if people come back and this is now to do with the emotional state. So once again, women will tend to always be looking at the diet. And so if somebody comes back and says, well, I tried to do this for 30 days, but you know, I just keep eating sugar or I just overeat and I can't resist. Or if there's still those patterns of overeating or the sugar addiction, then it's about getting to the emotional side of it, mm-hmm. right? And we almost have to put the diet aside for a while because that just stresses them out and then they start to beat themselves up because they can't follow what I've given them. Yes. And they think, oh, I'm failing. I can't do this. I have no willpower. I'm horrible. I'm going to be fat forever. They start going down that road. And so I have to say, we're going to have to put the diet over here. Like, of course, I want them to still continue to eat better, But it's a real red flag to me that we've got something else going on. And this is really common. Even in the people that come back saying that they've done really well, you still have to be so careful because if they've suffered with eating issues in the past, likely those aren't going to disappear within 30 days. Definitely not. Right. Yeah, they're going to be in that pattern still and it has to be broken at some point. So we're going to go to the emotional thing in just a second. But Is there anything that you do see women doing within the diet that could be stalling their weight loss, causing weight loss resistance, something like that? If they have made the changes, are there any tweaks that you see, like not eating enough, Mm -hmm. eating too much, anything like that? With the keto diet specifically, I see so many women doing it wrong. And so they'll do things like They're eating copious amounts of fat, but they're still having a lot of carbohydrates as well. So that Mm -hmm. can be an issue where they just start to pack it on (laughs) because that's just like the perfect storm when you mix high carbohydrate with high fat. So I always tell them they have to be really careful with that. Or they're still drinking, let's say. I had somebody did that recently, wasn't losing weight, wasn't gaining, but wasn't losing, but she was drinking all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, your body, it won't convert into (laughs) to burning ketones if you're constantly drinking. You know, it just can't. So something like that I've seen. Most people can very rarely will have anybody ever gain 
That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if somebody's gone off and they've kind of done what I've told them to do and they've been following it and they haven't lost weight, well, then we can look at those underlying issues. But very rarely does somebody, I don't even think of anybody that's actually gained. I had one girl recently who had been doing keto for six months and was continually gaining. And I kept telling her that she had to get off the keto because her stress levels were so high. She did night shifts. She worked two jobs. The poor girl, her adrenals were shot. She had low thyroid. But she loved the keto because it got rid of her sugar cravings. And Mm -hmm. she used to be a sugar addict. So she was determined to stay on it. And I finally, she's like, I just keep gaining. And I said, because you got to get off. I told her to go to paleo because she had done 30 days of paleo in one of my challenges. And so she came off of keto just for that 30 days. And that was the first time she had lost weight and she Mm. lost weight during that 30 days. Yeah. So that's an interesting conversation. When do you make that recommendation to do keto versus paleo? And what do you think the difference is? Like for instance, that her, what was it about keto that was causing her to gain versus paleo that wasn't? I personally think her stress levels were so high that whenever your cortisol goes up, your blood sugar goes up. It raises blood sugar. So a lot of people don't know that, right? Right. And so if her blood sugar was constantly going up, I think her body was probably having a very hard time switching to burning ketones instead of glucose. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's what was happening. And she also had said that whenever she tried to intermittent fast, and this is what kind of made me think this too, is she said that she would do it. And when she stopped, like in the afternoon, you know, she'd just go to like noon or whatever, not eating. She said she would just be ravenous and want to eat everything in sight. Mm. And I thought, no, no, no. You burning ketones? You're not doing that then, right? You don't come off of intermittent fasting shaking like you have a blood sugar drop. Definitely not. You should be burning fat. Right. So, yeah, Yeah, I actually, I think that's a really good point to make is if your stress is so high to the point that you can't get into ketosis, which was probably her case, was she just never actually got into ketosis, even when doing a ketogenic diet because of the the blood sugar that was constantly being produced, you know, her glucose was constantly being spiked. I mean, even just working an overnight shift would do that with your cortisol. So that's really an interesting case. And so for you and and in your practice, I'm assuming just making the, the switch, like in her case, to go more paleo would be just reducing the fats a little bit and yeah. increasing the carbs a little bit. Yeah. Cause my guess is she wasn't burning the fat. So her body was still on glucose. Like, I don't know if you follow Dr. Jack Cruz at all. I do. Yeah. He's a bit of an extremist, <laughs> Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> but super smart guy. Like I just listened to a really interesting podcast and I'm not going to be able to say it like he does because it's a lot of science. It was way mm-hmm. too beyond my <laughs> yes. brain capacity. He was talking a lot about there's certain people that cannot get into ketosis because they're low in DHA. Oh. And one of the factors is that certain people are super sensitive to EMF waves. Yes. And that somehow enough. changes their biology somehow where their body won't convert to ketones, won't switch over. And so he goes on this huge rant about it. So if you Google Evan Brand show, I think his his show is called Not Just Paleo. I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, not just paleo. Yes. Jack Cruz. It's his second, I think, interview with him. Okay. On Jet with Jack Cruz. It was uh, more recent. So yeah, I'll link it up in our show notes here. So we'll people will be able to listen to that because that's fascinating. Again, something yes. like just EMFs in general are very much over my head. <laughs> yes. Me too. I, it's like I don't even want to go there. It's like, don't give me one more thing that I need to right, worry about. Exactly. And that's kind of how I feel. And for people that don't even know what EMFs <laughs> mean, it's electromagnetic field. It would basically be yeah. any of the waves that come come from your like Wi-Fi connection, yes. your phone. I mean, you can get really deep in the weeds on that. And so it's a little scary, but I do definitely want to learn more about that. So I'll be listening for sure. Maybe I can do yeah. a little synopsis for everyone when I listen in. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, wanna, I, go ahead. I want to know more about the DHA thing. 
And I, I just haven't had time to go back and re- listen to it. I listened to it on the way home in my car and I thought, i got to go back to that because is could it be as simple as do we just need to increase the DHA in our body in order for us to then be able to get into ketosis? For these people that have a hard time or that aren't losing weight and this could be the problem, could we just increase that? I don't know. So, Sean, you go do the homework. I will. I'm going to do some research. (laughs) Yeah, because, okay, and then for people that don't know what DHA is, it is a type of omega-3 fatty acid that you would get from fish. I take a high-dose fish oil every single day. I recommend that women do. That was on my supplement episode if you want to go back and listen to that. So, I mean, it would be kind of cool. I think fish Mm. oil and the omega-3 fatty acids are super important just for anti-inflammatory and all that stuff. But I could also see how in both of the cases, what he's talking about is just putting that low-grade stress on your body again. And maybe that could be Mm. enough where some people are more stressed out from that situation than others biologically. And so then we have a hard time getting into ketosis. Yeah, that could exactly. definitely be. Ooh, it's so interesting. Thanks Ooh, for bringing so that up. Now I have yes. something to research for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I want to know more about it. His stuff is really hard to follow because I tried just to read his post about it. And it's like it's... 10 pages long, the post. Mm-hmm. I'm like, holy lane. And he goes into it really deep. On the science level. We need so a Dr. Jack Cruz translator is what yes. we need. Dumb someone, it down. Yeah, dumb someone it down. dumb it down, create a blog post, and I will read that. <laughs> well, I think he's like a neuroscientist doctor. Yes. I studied his work for a while just with the leptin resistance. He has a leptin yes. reset and the cold thermogenesis and stuff like that. I tried all of that last year. It was really fun. But now we're just getting okay. nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> back to this conversation about nutrition. So just real quick, is there anybody yeah. that you don't recommend keto for specifically? Yes. Okay. Let's yeah. talk about that. Sure. So I used to because I kind of came on to like, I thought, oh my God, keto is the best thing ever because... I had myself had great results with it and I'd seen other people have great results with it. And so I started to try it out on basically everybody that came through the door and I quickly realized that was probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) For a lot of my clients, I feel like they need to start with paleo if they're making a big change to their diet. I think that that was a big thing. So if they're, you know, new to this whole world of paleo, which a lot of my clients are, Mm -hmm. They're still in that mindset of low fat, whole grain. I eat my oats every morning and, you know, I'm chronically doing cardio all the time. So they're in this totally different headspace. So to throw them into this, you know, high fat ketogenic diet, they're just like, what? (laughs) I can't do that. So I found that paleo to start is sometimes, you know, a better call on some of these with some women that I'm working with. And then if I see that they need to take it a step farther, then I take them into the ketogenic diet. Like I just had a woman that was so new to this. She had terrible autoimmune problems. So she had to do the AIP paleo, which is strict enough already. And she's just done so amazing. And she's been about three months. And I said, you know what, in the spring, you're doing keto, like it's time. And she would never have imagined doing keto before. And now she was like, yep, I'll do whatever you say, Karen. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Because I know that that's kind of be the nail in the coffin or whatever you want to call it. Like the, it's going to seal the deal for her. Right. She's just almost there. Her body's doing so much better. And I think even six months on the ketogenic diet to really seal up that gut. I think is going to be a good call. So yeah, so for a lot of women, I that's kind of why I don't start them on keto right away. When I do start people on keto, even if it is a shock to them, it's because they either have a lot of weight to lose, they've got severe sugar addiction. So it's like alcoholic. I always say that you have to treat it like an addiction because if you tell somebody that they can still have a little bit right? Like here, you can have your dark chocolate or your sweet potatoes and your squash and these kind of higher carbohydrate dishes that will send them over the edge of, okay, now I want more, more, more Mm -hmm. for carbohydrates. Just like you can't tell an alcoholic, like here, just have a sip of vodka every day and you'll be okay. You know what I mean? Right. It's a runaway train. So I, now I'm really good with saying to them, like, it does it have to be an all or nothing thing? And if it is, then we need to just start with keto, even if it's a huge shock to their world, basically, of something they've totally, a complete opposite end of what they were eating. 
Right. Yeah. I think that there definitely is a case where sometimes it works better to take that kind of step-by-step approach, start just eliminating the grains and that kind of thing first, yeah. and then go to keto as that progresses and more healing needs to be done and, and that kind of thing. I think that's an amazing approach. Yeah. But then some people on the yeah. same token need to just go for it and just they do, do it. You know, Depending on what you have going on health-wise, you may not have the yes. time. No, well, that's, I was going to say that, like, if it's somebody with PCOS, cancer, they've got, you know, I don't work with people with dementia or Alzheimer's, but if I did, that's what I would do instantly is keto, you know, metabolic disorder. There's so many things that keto could be used for therapeutically. And I think then you just have to go for it. Yeah. Just start eating all the fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. That works. Yeah. Okay, great. So now I really want to move on to this whole emotional mindset, that whole piece, because I truly think, and I'm becoming more and more convinced of this every single day as I'm doing research yeah. just in order to help women, is that this is just something completely overlooked. Yeah. That is yeah. causing a huge disconnect from our mind to body. And thus yeah. keeping you in whatever place you're at, whether it is weight loss resistance yeah. or maybe it's whatever other health issues you have, you're stuck yeah. because of what's going on in your head. Uh, absolutely. And I think this is probably the biggest thing, isn't it? It really is. And, but it's <laughs> yeah. it's just completely not even addressed anywhere. No, because it's huge. And yeah. it's a lot for people to look at, right? Because then they're having to look at their emotions. They're having to look at their life which can be a real challenge. And right now, once again, we're in this epidemic of, you know, we're being told that the more we buy, the more money we have, those are the things that will make us happy. Right. <laughs> right. And so women are getting lost in that world of, you know, I need more in order to be happy and always looking for the grass is greener on the other side. <laughs> and I really see it and I, I wonder if you do too, is around the late 30s, early 40s, yes. women come in and they're really just not happy. And it's not even so much that it's a relationship problem or a job problem. It's that for the first time in their life, like their kids have grown up, you know, they don't need to be watched as much. And we have this shift that happens internally at that age where it's suddenly about us, not everybody else around us. Mm -hmm. right? Like when we're in our twenties and thirties, it's all about, okay, get the job. We want the husband, we need the kids and that's our focus. And then we start to transition and we start to get into this place where it's like, what about me? And they get unsettled and we turn to food or we turn to alcohol because that's a, something that will, can we can easily give to ourselves. It gives us a momentarily feeling of happiness and for some reason, it's more sociably acceptable than if a woman said, you know what, I'm just going to go take a few hours to myself because I need it. Right. <laughs> it's easier to shove the cupcake in the mouth, right? Or to have the glass of wine. Totally. And so that's pretty deep. It's no, pretty it's deep. It's true. Pretty big. <laughs> it's true. And, and like you mentioned, it comes from this place of being at a point where all of a sudden you realize you haven't really thought about yourself in a really long time. Yeah. Right. Yes. It's been a while. Yes. So I think this kind of comes with that whole idea of self care and learning how to make that more of a thing that you do on a very regular basis. And when you actually think about how can I take care of myself today, it never is going to be a cupcake. I mean, maybe once in a while, like your birthday, maybe like <laughs> some holidays, whatever. Then that's like, yeah, this dessert is going to do me some great things. Yeah. But most of the time, that's not going to be it. Instead, it would be no. something like taking a walk, talking to friends, going to have coffee, yeah. taking a bath, something like that. You know, yeah, so but what, what I think happens, of course, is if women will say, okay, I'm going to eat. Let's say I'm going to go on this ketogenic or paleo diet and – they go headstrong into it and they don't realize that there's more to it than just, you know, when they start to cheat on it, they start to blame the diet mm -hmm. and they just start to blame themselves for their lack of willpower. And they think, oh, why can't I just say no to the cupcake or the cookies? Why can't I just say no? And they just beat themselves up and they start to look for the next best quick fix diet to fix that problem. When they need to put the diet aside and they need to say, no, it's not about you not having willpower. It's not about that. 
what is it really about? And what usually tries to happen is women just try to say no when they need to replace that cupcake with something else. Mm -hmm. And I always tell, don't take away a pleasure without replacing it with a pleasure, just a more healthier version of it. We need that. We're going to it for a reason. We're reaching for the cupcake for a reason. We're reaching for the wine for a reason. We're going shopping. Maybe it's a shopping addiction. We're doing that for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So what else could you be then be giving to yourself that isn't going to cause weight gain or unhealthy body, right? <laughs> right? So that's where women have the hardest time. Because like I said, it's not sociably acceptable. What they always tell me when I say, what do you do for yourself? Every single woman says, I go to the gym. Mm. That's it. And I'm like, yeah, but that's because you can justify that. You're way more comfortable saying to your husband or to whomever, I'm going to the gym. Oh, okay. Go to the gym. But if you were to be like, I'm just going to go and have a pedicure or a massage, or I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to just go be by myself. That's not as acceptable. And it's not even acceptable to themselves. Yeah. Right? It's hard to take that time for yourself when it's like, but my kids need this and my husband yes. needs, their partner needs this and whatever, you know, it's. Yeah. But they justify the gym. Mm-hmm which is crazy because that just makes problems. I mean, the gym is good. It's always good to work out, but that's still not like, let's just completely go have a time out where I'm filling up my cup, right? People go to the gym because they get a little payoff. They get the hormone payoff of norepinephrine and nephrine and all those things that come out, right? The cortisol right. rush. Yeah. So once again, it's something that's going to be just short-lived. And so we want something that's going to fill you up. Like you said, like connection, that's a huge one. Community. Mm-hmm. My People need to one. go out. They need to find their community. Yeah. And if it's just connecting with a friend on a phone call yes. for 15 minutes, you know, it's yeah. still doing something that's filling you up and is specifically for you. Yeah. I love that. Okay. But moving on, what about specifically related to past dieting habits and not being able to shrug that off or bad body image or just having this whole negative mindset towards food? I mean, there's a lot that we could go into, yeah. but when you're yeah. working with someone with weight loss resistance, they usually hate their body. They do. Yeah, they really do. And trying, and to, get, trying to get that body to change when you hate it is really hard. <laughs> Yeah. And that comes back to a lot of that neuro association, which was, you know, when in the beginning, when we were talking about like changing your perception of your stress, mm-hmm. it's kind of what wires together in the brain, which means every time if you sit down to food and you instantly think, oh my God, I'm so fat. If I'm going to just overeat this and then I'm going to gain more weight and I'm not going to be able to say no, then I'm going to go eat the cake. If that's what you're thinking every single time you sit down, that you're going to go down that terrible road. And so it's about changing those neural pathways into something more positive, which is very challenging. (laughs) I might add, I always tell people it's easy to go down. It's like a highway when you're going down that negative loop of, I hate my body. So if every time you look in the mirror, this is another good example, you sit there and you pick your body apart. Well, that thought pattern is like going down to the big highway. You've gone down it your whole life. So it's so easy for you to start picking your body apart and putting yourself down. So to start changing that, it's like you're trying to get a big, huge car through a tiny, tiny hole. It's going to hurt for a while. (laughs) It's going to be hard, but it's like a muscle. The more you work at it, it's going to get easier and easier. So when you catch yourself, and I suggest just starting with one little thing. I remember Tony Robbins example was so perfect. He was saying that, because he talks a lot about neuro association. So he had grown up with the mother that told him to eat everything on his plate. So did I, right? I think we all did. Mm -hmm. And he said that in his adult life, he started gaining weight and started realizing that he was always overeating. And so to him, if he didn't finish everything that was on his plate, he would feel guilty right? Because I remember my mom always saying that, like, finish everything on your plate. You know, there's starving kids in Africa, finish everything on your plate kind of thing, right? And so he had to change that thought pattern. And so he said for one month, every single night, he would stop eating his dinner halfway through his plate. He'd push it aside. He'd turn on his favorite music and he would dance. (laughs) Super cheesy. Don't think I would ever do it. However, That's exactly what I'm talking about. He's changing what he associated that with. 
Right. Right. So if in the morning you weigh yourself every morning, well, stop weighing yourself because immediately that wrecks your entire day. You're associating it with something negative. If you look at yourself in the mirror every day and pick yourself apart, instead, pick out the things that are great about you. We all have qualities, right? So if you think you have pretty eyes, well, then just tell yourself, you know what? I've got really beautiful eyes or concentrate on what feels better. So if you're following a new eating program and you might not be losing weight what it has improved. There's usually always improvements. And this is funny because women will come in and they'll be like, I haven't lost any weight. And I'll be like, okay, well, how's your digestion? Well, that's really good. I'm not bloated anymore. And I feel a lot more energetic. It's like, well, that's fantastic. Right. <laughs> right. Like concentrate on the positives. Those non-scale victories. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The non-scale victories. Yeah. Perfect. It's huge. And it is something I see in my class, the Fat Burning Feebone Project every day. It's like, all of this stuff is going so well because I'm in ketosis and I sleep better and my mood's better and I haven't fought with my husband and like all this stuff, but I haven't lost weight. And it's like, okay, yeah. well then take off the butt part of that and yeah. let's just focus on all that good stuff you just listed. You know, yes. you have yeah. a lot to celebrate. Which, but we don't. Yeah. We're so used to talking about the negative, right? It's yeah. way easier to talk about negative. And that's the other thing is very few women will walk around going like, oh, I have so much more energy and I just feel this and I feel great. Instead, they're going to be like, I'm fat. I can't lose weight. And they concentrate on the negative, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I know. And we're associated to do that. I mean, that's what our default is. But we do have another option. You can go to the positive. You can really find those things to celebrate about your body and your life and everything. And it truly makes a world of difference. Yeah. And I think we have to go at it in that headspace of the, hey, this isn't going to be a quick fix. So mm -hmm. don't think that it is. Plan to work on this for years. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, maybe it'll be a month and you're going to be healed. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> Everything will be gone. I don't know. But it's way better to think long term because we live in this society of quick fix diets and quick fixes just in general take the pill, eat the food, everything's going to be great. You kind of work on it and you may need to get help. That's the other thing. Go get help. If you have really poor self-image problems, maybe you've had deep-seated emotional stuff from your childhood. I think we all do. Work with somebody that can help you work your way through it because that's the root of the issue, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like I said, I didn't lose any weight from changing my diet. It wasn't till I kind of got a hold of that emotional stuff that was the biggest game changer for me. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. This conversation has been amazing as I knew it would be because <laughs> we have the same brain. Yes. But tell people what you do on a regular basis, who you help, how they can get in touch with you, the programs yes. you've got going, all that stuff. So you can find me at KarenMartel.com. Super easy. I that. work. I work with women to help them find what I call their weight loss code. So I look at all those things that we've talked about today. We're going to look at your hormones, your digestion, your stress levels, and of course your diet, because that is different for everybody. There's some people that can handle some foods than others can't. So I always start with the paleo diet, but we can work our way from there basically, right? I also run a membership program, which is I had Sean on. Um, mm -hmm. when was that like a month ago for, or no longer than that? Yeah. Maybe. A couple months, I a few think. months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called on track and it's a group coaching and meal planning program where we offer ketogenic autoimmune paleo and just a basic gluten-free meal plan. And then within that, we do mini challenges. We have guest speakers like Sean come in that can, you know, I'm always trying to educate the women that are in the program so that you get to learn more and more. And we do lots of spiritual stuff and lots of anti-stress stuff. I actually just had Sean, Steve Ozanich on. Oh, have you heard him. of him? No. So write him down, Stephen Ozanich, okay. right? I think O-Z-A-N-I-C-H. And for those of you, you can look him up. He wrote the book, The Great Pain Deception. And it's all about mind-body connection. Mm. Basically, he created all illness and it all stems from suppressing emotions in our body. And it's fascinating. I'm just partway through his book and I'm already like, oh my gosh. What's the book, <laughs> What's the book called? It's called The Great Pain Deception. Oh my gosh, he, I love it. Yeah, when I post the, you, I can even send it to you now, I'll post the, my interview with him so you can get an idea. Okay. But it's way out there, it's far out there. 
And so for a lot of people, it's going to be like, whoa, but this is the sort of thing that I love to educate women on. And I know you do too. And it's about getting more connected with your body and how much our emotions have to do with everything that's going on inside ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I think your membership program just sounds so cool. I mean, any woman would benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen anything like it out there yet. I've seen lots of meal planning programs, but there's nothing that's quite like the on track where we're trying to incorporate all the aspects of what could help somebody to lose weight and just be the healthiest version of themselves, right? It takes a lot. There's all these different little factors coming in. So it's incorporating all of that into a program. I love it. Karen, thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women. This was great. I'm sure it's going to help so many women and we'll make sure that they have everything they need to go and check you out over on your website and your programs and stuff like that. So everyone will go do that. But thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. We could have talked for hours. I know. I know. That's the hard part. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Okay. Thanks. Before we move on to what's coming to Keto for Women in the next few weeks, a quick reminder to check out this episode's sponsor, Health IQ, the company that brings life insurance savings to the health conscious. Head to healthiq.com slash keto to take your lifestyle quiz and see if you qualify for a lower rate. That's healthiq.com slash keto. I hope you all enjoyed my nice chat with Karen I just had. And just as a reminder, what we have coming up over the next few episodes, you can make sure you catch all of the information you want to catch. In the next two episodes coming up in January, we're going to be chatting about ketones. So first of all, what they actually do, why we actually want to produce them. I know I talk a lot about the importance of ketone production, I want to go into further detail and actually let you know the healing benefits that are there when you produce ketones. So that's the first episode. And then the second episode, we're going to kind of expand further on that, but then talk about how to test, why, what happens when numbers are too high, what happens when numbers are too low, all of the in-between and what you're actually looking for and things you can change if you want to change your ketone reading. So that will be coming up. And then my next interview, we will be talking all about cholesterol, insulin, types of fats to eat in a ketogenic diet, just an awesome conversation that I had with someone I admire who I met at the Low Carb Universe Conference and got her on the show because she does such a great job explaining things. So that's what's coming up this month on Keto for Women. And I can't wait for you to hear more. We'll talk to you then. 